Hello, I'm Graham Fitch, coming to you from Steinway Hall in London for Pianist Magazine. Before I get to the lesson, I'm delighted to inform our regular viewers and subscribers about a new free ebook that we have for you featuring my masterclasses from over the years, uh, such topics as fingering, uh, redistribution between the hands, scales and arpeggios, all sorts of things like that. And you will see details on the screen right now and in the description box. So go ahead and download it and let us know what you think about it in the comments below. So my subject for today is how to make exercises out of our pieces. I'll be touching on the subject, the kind of thorny subject of studies and exercises. Do we need them? Can we get the technique from the pieces themselves or do we need to look outside of the pieces and build up our technique from um, exercises and studies? So let's just first of all define what the difference is between an exercise and a study. An exercise is something, it should be something really short, really easy to remember. We don't read it from notation. We look down at our hands and our keyboard and we can put all our focus on achieving one particular motion, one particular uh, thing that we're after, sensation perhaps. A study on the other hand has artistic merit. It's got structure, it's formal, um, it has some sort of design to it uh, and the best studies, Chopin list, are art music of the greatest caliber. We wouldn't listen to them thinking necessarily that they were to do with developing piano technique. They stand on their own. So let's look at um, a couple of examples. Now just yesterday I was teaching the Ravel Sonatina to one of my US students via Zoom and we were looking at a rhythmical feature in the third bar that the student was struggling to, to get. Let me just play you the opening, see if you can hear this rhythmical feature. Did you notice there at the end of that third bar, the end of the phrase? There's a little end. Ravel wants us to breathe and start again. And in order to make us, um, or to, to make that easier for us, he divides the beat first of all in fours, 30 second notes, demi semi quavers, then, then in threes, just on that last little bit, we find a triplet. Now I pointed this out to, to my student and they struggled a little bit with it. I said, let's just try something quickly. Can you play a scale, any scale you like, let's say two octaves, with the rhythm one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. So they only had to do that once in order to feel that in the context of the piece. Did you hear it there? Now, if I was to trying to correct that in the context of the piece, we've got all sorts of complexities. We've got pedaling, we've got to read the score, we've got one hand in the way of the other. But by using a scale, which we know, we know by heart, we could put all our attention on that one rhythmical feature. And by doing it over two octaves up and down, we got to repeat that rhythmical feature a number of times. And the student was actually quite surprised that they were able to get it after just one time through with that exercise. So going back to the nursery slopes now, Bergmuller, La Candeur, the first one from Opus 100. Um, let's say I'm learning this, let's say I'm an elementary pianist, more or less a beginner, and I've got this piece and I want to learn about wrist circles, or my teacher wants me to learn about wrist circles. Let me play you a little bit first. So the idea behind wrist circles is not only to make the movements feel free, but to make the sounds uh, yummy and gorgeous. If I played with my fingers, can you hear how syllabic that is? It's like robot speech. So with a wrist circle, what I need to do is to come up with my pinky and then round. Can you see the circle there? So 
if I were a teacher of somebody who was playing this piece, I might get them to do a little exercise based on that note pattern. So you would memorize this first very easy. It's just a five finger position with the fourth finger missed out. So what am I doing? Looking down at my hands, I can practice that wrist circle in the form of an exercise. Now the exercise does have some form, it has structure. I move up a sixth, I move up a sixth each time. Ah, I'm really getting the feeling of that circle. And if I wanted to let the left hand develop that skill, perhaps I could do the same thing in contrary motion. Doesn't end quite so well like that, but do you get the idea? Now, the next idea is going to cause some of you to go, ah, he's going to use Hannon. What I'm doing is I'm taking a Hannon exercise and I'm using it for my own devious ends. I'm going to take Hannon number one and use it to practice my wrist circle. Because I can easily remember that pattern of notes. You see what I'm doing there? So I'm, I'm taking a, some innocent notes that happen to be written by Hannon. I'm not doing it as Hannon says on the tin, um, the instructions. I'm using it to develop the wrist circle. So if I go on a little bit, maybe I notice one particular day that my thumb feels a bit sluggish, that it's not really moving as I'd want. Again, I could take a scale and practice it with thumb two, thumb two. Let me show you. Let me take left hand. I'm going to take a scale with some black notes in it. One, two, one, two. Come back up. Listen for evenness. And without stopping, one, three, one, three. come back up and if I really want one four one four if if your hand is big enough to manage that you can do that again I like to refinger Hannah as to make a, a thumb exercise instead of doing one two three four five how about one two three four thumb and another one I like to do with Hannon five and one. Now what, what's that good for, you're probably asking. It's very good to sense the closed-handed attitude that we need at the piano. We, we don't really want to stretch out and keep in a five-finger position. So this exercise, one, two, three, four, five and one, I've added an extra note. I won't be able to play that unless I move laterally here. So that's a neat little exercise, uh, very easy to remember, that we can practice just to develop a little, little bit of lateral freedom in the wrist. Now, let's look at a real honest-to-goodness study. Now, I've got in front of me here Czerny Germer. Now, this is Czerny, but collected by Heinrich Germer. Uh, you can find this um, easily available in, in music shops and online. Books one and two. Now what he's done is he's taken the best of Czerny and stuck them all together in one or actually two volumes. So you don't have to have a groaning bookshelf full of Czerny. You can get the best of it um, in one or two books. Now let's have a little look at it because I could do this study really badly and think, oh, I've got weak fingers. Let me show you badly. Don't copy this. Now, anybody who's looking at that would be shrieking in horror because I'm locking my hand and using my fingers like pistons in the way that we were all taught years back. This was deemed to be the, the way to move. Now we know better. We know that that's not how the body works. Let me move a little bit into, away from thumb alignment, into third finger. 
alignment. So I'm now lined up over three, four, five. Should feel a little easier. But I still feel like I want mobility there. So there's all sorts of motions that I need to uh, equip my hand with or my body with. So I've got their lateral movements. I've got a little bit of wrist circle motion going on. I've also got rotations. Now we don't need to feel every single rotation, maybe one or two, maybe that one, that one. Some of them we can feel, that one. So if I practice that exercise badly, not only would it not do me any good, it would actually do me harm. So it's seriously important if we're practicing any exercise or study to do it with good motion. In other words, to do it well. The third one in the book, Cherny Gamma Book One, is all to do with rotational movements. If I try to do this just with my fingers, let, let's have a look at it. That's tight for me. That really doesn't feel very good in my hand. Can you see how the movement worked? My elbow was in one place, my wrist was supported, and I rotate freely. Lovely sensation in the body, and I can do that fast and freely. So moving on to some more advanced repertoire, I've got in front of me a snippet from the Debussy La Fille aux Cheveux de Lain, the girl with the flaxen hair. And this is a spot that I've noticed over the years people get twisted up in. And it's marked bar 14. Let me play it for you. Just that little bit. Now, I have developed my own series of little exercises which are, you can find in my own study edition of the piece. Let me show you, it's just, I'll show you the right hand first. So what I do is a double, what I call a double at the top. In other words, repeating the two fingers. And I've got two levels of sound there, a mezzo forte on the top, pianissimo underneath. And now the next part of the exercise, I find the doubles in the lower voice. Now I'm gonna put the doubles in both voices. And if I would now go back to the example, ah, that feels so much freer and, and easier, having just gone through those exercises once, which so is basically one exercise in three stages. I've also got one uh, along similar lines for the left hand. So all we'd need to do would be occasionally to practice the exercises just to keep that um, pattern in really good shape for the hand. Another lesson I gave recently, um, somebody was playing the second arabesque of Debussy. Let me play you the first part. We know that piece, very light and delicate. It relies on freedom in the releases. Let me just show it to you slowly. I've got to come up there. One motion that takes in four notes. Now this particular student was frightened to come up. So he was joining, staying on the keyboard and getting quite tight. And of course what happened was the, the playing was rather uneven and uncomfortable and it didn't feel very coordinated. So just the instruction to come up, 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 wasn't enough. So what I had to do was to come up quickly with 
some exercises for practice. And actually, we did the exercise in the lesson and it worked almost immediately to change the, the, the motion. What I did was inserted a rest in between each group. So instead of one, two, three, four, we did this, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And on the rests, I had, I had to come right up to the top of the full board here and risk. It didn't matter if the notes were wrong, but I wanted time for the hand to come way further than, it, than it's ever going to need to do. That was one exercise, and you may think, well, that's so simple. Yes, exercises should be simple. The next exercise involved playing this group of notes in several different octaves. Now, can you see what's going on there? If I'm, if I'm not moving correctly, I wouldn't be able to get to the next octave in time. Simple exercise, just take a pattern of notes and repeat it. It forces, I don't like to use the word force, but it compels us to move. There were various other exercises I gave her too, but in the end, that was enough to shift it considerably in the lesson. And I'm confident that the next time I see her, that will have resolved. However, if the person, if the student were overdoing that movement, because that can be overdone, an exercise I would give them to do would be something along these lines where we didn't have a long note at the end. We can do it delicately. Do you see how that does the exact opposite? So the, the exercise is dependent on what it is you need, what, what it is the student needs. Now, I've got in front of me a, an advanced piece of music by Chopin, the B-flat minor sonata, which I learned as a student. And then I switched teacher, and my new teacher gave me the Courtauld edition, uh, the study edition, Alfred Courtauld, that has lots of footnotes with exercises that he came up with. And I practiced these exercises, and after a week, the, my playing of this piece had improved no end. Um, in terms of its comfort. I was staggered by how much progress I made just by doing these exercises. I would issue a word of caution though. Some of them involve stretches between the fingers, which I would not recommend. In fact, I would say, please do not do them. We don't need to do those. Really important to be discerning which exercises we practice out of this material. But so to give you an example, the very beginning, the left hand is quite intricate. <laughs> So the left hand there, you can see, is quite athletic. So if I show you left hand by itself, let me do it without the pedal so you can hear it. That's a little slower. That's probably the tempo. So the first exercise that Courteau recommends for the left hand, um, actually not the first, but one, one of the exercises. I don't really like the first one, if I may be bold as to say, but the, the, the one down the page. That led me to come up with this exercise of my own. First I take the B flat, then I take the D flat. Then what I found for myself useful would be to alter the pivot note in the middle, which is an F. That's the note that the hand pivots around. Actually, we could practice that as well. but I like to move that pivot note around chromatically. My hand is big enough to manage that. Now let me do the same thing with the pinky. I don't want to go down lower than the B flat because that would involve a stretch, but I could come up. These sorts of exercises are really helpful in nailing the left hand pattern. 
Let me show you just quickly what he suggests, what Corto suggests for the right hand in the next phrase. We've got double notes. So what we would do first for that is to take the top line by itself. And then the lower line by itself. And I can do that against the left hand. Here's the lower line. Be able to do that, that's seriously helpful. The next uh, exercise that from Cotto is this. And then the reverse. Making triplets of, first of all, the top. And then triplets on the underneath. Um, let me do that better. There we go. And various other things for the left hand, which again, takes quite a lot of athleticism to be able to manage. Hold the pivots. Simple exercise. So what, what I found, having gone through a few of these Courteau uh, exercises, that I could generate my own um, in other places, in, not in this particular piece, but in other pieces. And I'm going to, let me just see, yes, I'm going to go to, to the E-flat Nocturne now, also by Chopin, and just give you an exercise that I think, if you're struggling with this left hand, you know the piece. The left hand, as you can see, is quite mobile in here. Um, if you're struggling with that left hand, I can guarantee you that if you go through these stages, it will be noticeably easier almost immediately. So what I'm going to do is just to recognize that my, my first note is a single note, pinky note. Um, I play it with a pinky, you could play it with a third finger. Then I've got a two note chord going to a three note chord and that recipe he sticks with for most of this piece is based on that. So I've got bottom top, bottom middle top. Yeah, are you with me so far? What I'm going to do is to practice the bottom two. So from pinky to, in this case, fourth finger. Let me just show you one bar. So that's the bottom note of the first chord to the bottom note of the next chord. Now let me go from the bottom note to the middle note. I've got to know which finger plays that middle note. Now let me go from the bottom note to the top note. Ah, it's an octave. Okay, now let me go from the top note to the top note. Now let me go from the top note to the middle note. Ah, it's the same note. Same finger, same note. And now from the top note to the bottom note. Are you with me? Okay, now I can go from the bottom note to the top two notes. I'm not going to bore you by showing you this whole thing, but now I'm doing two notes rather than one note. You can, anybody who's got some sort of mathematical nous about them will be able to figure out how many combinations there are in that first bar. If you go through them all, doing each stage as well as you can do it, when you finally put that together, you can be prepared to be somewhat amazed that your hand, ah, my hand now just goes to those notes. Miracle. It's not miracle, you've just made a whole series of little stages, exercises, that led you to that destination. Just quickly, I'm going to show you the pathetic sonata, Beethoven, the spot that everybody seems to fall over at, which is bar 93.
and he does it again. Now, what could we do in our exercise practice for this? We could very straightforwardly block. We could block and tap the outer notes. Just replay um, the pinky fingers. We could do the same with our thumbs. See what I'm doing there? I could do that with my middle finger. I could do the middle finger first. And then touch in the outer notes afterwards. Fantastic thing to practice. I could do some rhythm work. I'm stopping there on the first note of each group. How about I stop on the second note of each group? All sorts of other things. I could go on for a long time generating exercises that would make that passage yield and fly out of our fingers. Let's get one more. Let me give you one more. The Beethoven, again Beethoven, the Opus 10 number no. 1 sonata, the C minor sonata, the second theme, I've often noticed people struggle with this left hand. Now the left hand is kind of an Alberti pattern. Now, if I wanted to make an exercise out of that, I could hold down my B flat with my thumb, because the B flat happens every other note. So I'm going to hold that now in the key. And play the other note, so I hear the line. Now, if I want to take that a step further, how about I hold on? Let me do that so that the camera can pick up what I'm doing. I'm holding onto the B-flat there with my other hand, and I'm playing normally. Because I am uh, stopped that key from sounding, I'm able to hear exactly what I'm doing underneath. Is this even? Does that line have good shape? If I wanted to make another little exercise, I could let my right hand play the B-flat. It's dead easy to get the right sound like that because all I do is play my right hand really light. Now, can I replicate that sound? That was better, I noticed, because I'd already got the sound in my ear from this. When I did it with one hand, I was able to get there quicker, closer to the sound because I'd already heard it. Who demonstrated it for me? Me, myself. So these are some ideas for how you can practice productively, creatively, by finding exercises and practice ideas from within the pieces themselves. Um, I hope that's given you a few ideas. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time.